Thank you so much for being here this morning. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to see you. Uh, dearly loved people, appreciate you being here very, very much. I've been looking forward to this uh, occasion for quite a while now, and appreciate the invitation to come. It is an honor uh, to be with you. It's been a while since I have been here, and thank you so much, and thank you for the wisdom in hosting such an event. Um, there are sermons that, that give us a lot of pleasure, joy to preach. Um, we rejoice in, in the ability to, to preach them, and there are others that that while we rejoice, for instance, in the nature of God and what God has decreed and declared, uh, that, that aren't filled with nearly as much joy because of the uh, situation of our culture and our world. Uh, we are in that second category this morning. We're going to be talking about human sexuality. I want to begin with a question. Is fire good or bad? And if you said bad, you could be thinking about a house being on fire or forest fires or explosions or things like that. And you would be absolutely right. If the first thought in your mind was fire is good, then you could be thinking about cooking your food, warming, warming yourself on a cold winter's night if you're out camping, that kind of thing, or providing light for you in the dark. All of those things are good. You see, fire, fire is a concept that is neither good nor bad. But depending on how you use it is the outcome. It's either good or bad, depending on what you do with it. Question number two, is fire powerful? And you say, absolutely, fire is powerful. Third and final question, when you think about an arsonist and a fireman, which one is obsessed with fire? And your answer is, after you've had a little while to think about it, you say, both. Both the arsonist and the fireman are obsessed with fire, but for very different reasons. The fireman is obsessed with the fire because it is his goal, his desire to protect people, to protect property, to keep people safe and alive. And he is dedicating his life, and sometimes individuals give their lives in attempting to stop fires that have started. The arsonist, on the other hand, does not care. He just wants to see the big fire. He doesn't care about boundaries. He doesn't care who gets hurt. He doesn't care about any of that. Powerful things have to have boundaries. Human sexuality one of the most powerful things in this physical realm. Now, we're not going to talk about every single one of these, uh, especially to the, to the degree uh, that we could, but human sexuality arises from the nature of God himself, how marriage and home and family and sex and gender reveal God's nature to me. One further question. And I thought about doing this, uh, but constrained by time, I decided we, I would just ask you and let you think about it. Use your imagination. The attributes of God, God's nature. If I said list as many attributes of, of God as you could in the next 60 seconds, I have no doubt that you would fill up maybe even two or three pages. That God is loving, gracious, merciful, kind. That God is patient. That God is sovereign. That God is just. That God is forgiving. That God, that the, the characteristic, the attribute that is discussed most in Scripture relative to the nature of God is His holiness. Genesis 1 and 2, I invite your attention to these passages if you, if you have your copy of God's Word with you. We are made, Genesis 1, 26, beginning. God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. We're going to spend some time today talking about that as we discuss human sexuality arising from the nature of a God who is good and a, and a, and a God that does good things, who has worked to help us gain heaven and avoid hell. And in, these, in, in the context of this creation event, it says, it reveals to us that God made male and female. God created them male and female. We read that in Genesis chapter 2, and I know that, that if you haven't heard this in any other place, uh, I don't know that I've 
I've ever done a wedding ceremony where I have not read Genesis chapter 2 at the end of the chapter. I, Adam is alone and lonely. God sees that condition and says it's not good that man should be alone. Caused a deep sleep to come on Adam. And you guys are familiar with this account. And while Adam slept, took a rib from his side. And with that rib, fashioned a woman, brought her to Adam. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. That's God's purpose. That's God's intent. That's God's design for the home and family. Man, woman, with this in mind, if I ask you, to list some purposes for marriage, home, family. I have no doubt that some of you immediately thought of companionship, that, that Eve was, was brought to Adam and going to be a help suitable for him. Uh, so companionship and, and to walk by his side and support and encourage and all those things. But the primary purpose of human sexuality is reproduction. If I ask you, what's the purpose of your lungs? I doubt anybody in here's first answer would be pleasure. My lungs are for pleasure. Now, I'm not telling you, as a matter of fact, I'm saying the exact opposite. Sexuality, sexual intimacy, in its proper boundaries, in its proper place, is incredibly good. God designed it so. So I'm not telling you the only time that we may engage in sexual intimacy as husband and wife is for the purpose of procreation. He didn't make us that way. But its primary purpose is to produce new little people. As a matter of fact, that was the command given to them was to, to be fruitful, multiply, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Genesis chapters 1 and 2 followed by the Song of Solomon. And in this book, we, it's a poetic celebration of marital love and how that husband and wife function together and love each other and, and are grateful and thankful for the physical attributes that they are, can enjoy from one another. Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 and 32, and then 19, 4 through 6. If I'm going too fast, it's Austin's fault. Because I have a limited amount of time to cover like, I don't know, maybe two weeks worth of material. I love that young man, so he knows I'm teasing him. Matthew 5, 31, 32, Matthew 19, 4 through 6. When Jesus is asked a question, they are testing him, trying to put him in, in a dilemma, trying to catch him in, in his words, in a, in a trap or in the netting of his words. And they ask him a question, Matthew 19, relative to, to divorce. May a man divorce his wife for any reason? Jesus was really good at doing this. He, he turns it back on them. Have you not read? Or how do you read? Meaning God has spoken on this particular thing. This is what God said. This is what God has done. This is what God means for you to do. How do you read? Don't you know that he who made them in the beginning made them male and female? And then he... Then he he quotes a big section of Genesis chapter 2 and God's original intention and God's original design for home and family and marriage. Ephesians chapter 5, Revelation 21, both of these, the, the Bible is bookended by two marriages. We just looked at one from Genesis 2, Adam and Eve, and then the marriage of Christ, Jesus Christ, and his bride, the church. So it begins with a marriage, and it ends with a marriage. And Revelation 21, I think about this quite a bit, and relative to my own wedding ceremony. I was standing at the front of the building that day, and I was scared to death, and my face was the same color as my white suit. Uh, and all of the groomsmen had taken their place, bridesmaids had, uh, best man, maid of honor. All there, the ring bearer, the flower girl, all of that was done. The door 
doors closed and a specific music started playing. And when those doors opened, it was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen in my life to this very day. It was my bride. Dressed for me. John sees the panorama of all that God has done, is doing, to help us gain heaven and avoid hell. He sees the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. And it says, as a bride adorned or prepared for her husband. It uses that, that expression three times in Revelation 21. The bride, the bride, the bride, the bride of Christ, the bride of Christ, the bride of Christ. The Bible begins with a marriage and it ends and closes with one. This is adapted from a book called Mama Bear Apologetics. And here's where we are today. Our culture is obsessed with sex. If you're prone to do this, turn on your television. I, I should say leave it off. But if you do, here's what you're going to see. Is that movies and music and advertisements are, are being promoted and sold. And, and godless things are being shoved down the throats of people who are watching. Not leading them toward God, but leading them away. Our culture is so absorbed with sexuality. Instead of pointing us to God, however, sexual pleasure has become a God in itself. It's all about, please me, 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 me. Please me. Whatever I want, nobody can tell me. Nobody can tell me what I can be and what I can do and where I can go. Nobody can tell me the partner that I must have. Nobody can say those things to me. I'm going to do whatever I want. Sexuality has become a ruler. And this ruler is very demanding. Sexual pleasure must be obeyed, and it is one to whom homage must be paid both in word and deed. You ever notice, guys, when the discussion about these things starts or, or, or the, the feelers are put out and, and the boundaries are, are tested and pushed, it's always just, just respect us and, and just leave us alone. It starts there with... Just recognize the fact that we are human beings. It never stops there. That's what they say they want, but what they want is your participation. We've gone now in, in all of these areas from accept, acceptance to validation. And what is happening, these things are being cloaked in the language of morality. Love. Don't, aren't you loving? Don't you think that God would want me to have an experience, a loving relationship? Why would you tell me I can't do that? So these, these concepts are couched in words that are filled with love, or at least seem to be filled with love and compassion and hope and help. The word affirmation today has been used a bunch. People are, are being fed lies that would cause them to kneel at the altar of pleasure. Again, this is from Mama Bear Apologetics. God's commands regarding sexuality are not some side aspect, nor does he mean for them to be. I want to go back just a little bit. Back in the beginning, I said that fire is a concept that is neutral. It is neither good nor bad. It just is. The Greeks have a word for things that fit into that category called the adiophora. Adiophora. Indifferent things. Now, unlike fire, that actually is a concept that is neutral, human sexuality is not. But the Greeks put human sexuality in the adiaphora, as if it made no difference. And their claim was, just take care of the soul. The body is unimportant. Whatever you do in the body is fine. I'm telling you, what you do in the body affects the soul, not just here and now, but eternally. So it's not part, human sexuality is not part of the audiophora. The, what God teaches us about human sexuality, about husbands and wives and parents and children and home, all of those things span both the Old Testament and New Testament, especially in terms of holiness, both God's and mine. Sexual holiness is, in essence, demonstration of one's knowledge, of knowledge of God and that person's commitment to God. 
sanctity of sexuality makes human beings different. One man, one woman for a lifetime. I said this the other day to a group, and I said, we have a couple of cats at our house, and one of them still is fully functional. Uh, he can produce little cats and does on a routine basis. He doesn't belong to me, so don't come up afterwards and say, well, why don't you have that cat fixed? He's not mine. That cat has no concern about the female cat that he wants to help reproduce kittens with. Doesn't matter to him. Doesn't matter if it's different female every single night. That's the way it is in the animal world. That's not true with human beings. You see, for them, it doesn't matter with whom they reproduce. For me, it matters both mightily and eternally. Human sexuality is part of God's plan, arising from his nature, and it's not a concession to the flesh. When we obey God, operate within God's purpose, and in keeping with his nature, then things are incredibly good. When we step outside those boundaries, however, the wheels fall off the bus, no longer good. And deal with people, talk to people, counsel people every single day. Broken hearts, broken homes, broken lives, and a lot of them it's because they have stepped outside the boundaries that God has given to us and designed for us to follow. Everything else, everything else, other than one man, one woman for a lifetime. Now I need to say this right here, and I, I might have should, have should have started with this. We've said a lot about marriage so far. You don't have to be married to go to heaven. You understand that, right? Paul was single. Jesus was single. So we're not talking about you are inferior in, in any kind of way. You're not. If you choose to remain single or if you or if you have married and, and your spouse has died, you are now a widow or widower, there's nothing preventing you from, from being faithful to God. Add to that this, Matthew 19, there are some who are eunuchs for the kingdom's sake, Jesus said. So one may choose to be that particular thing. So even though we're talking a lot about marriage, a husband and wife, home and family, Going to heaven isn't limited to that category. I just need to make that clear. Everything else that is outside God's purpose and opposed to God's nature is dishonoring being made in the image of God. Human sexuality is important to God. Human sexuality is shaped by the nature of God. It arises from His nature. Our bodies are not our own. How many times have you heard that expression? My body, my body, I'll do what I want. This comes up a lot. This comes up a lot, especially in the pro-life, in, in pro, the pro-choice, uh, those discussions. It's my body, and the child is growing within my body. I will do whatever I want to with, with whatever's growing inside my body, as if, as if we are autonomous. But we're not. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19, Paul wrote that our bodies belong to God and we should use our bodies to honor and glorify Him. Sexuality, sexual intimacy is incredibly good when engaged in according to God's purpose and creative intent. It's damaging when engaged in outside and against God's purpose for it. For the most part, we've done a, just an atrocious job of teaching God forgive me. That's my fault. To teach about the nature, to be able, to be able to, to talk about the nature of God and who He is and how, how much He longs for my company and fellowship and how He has created this, this the most intimate of all human relationships is that between husband and wife. My wife told me before we married, and she still tells me we've been married, I don't know how long, 36 years, long time. And uh, don't tell her I didn't know specifically. She told me before we married, if God blesses our home with children, and she told me this after we had them, I love you more than I love them. Yes, I love them. Number one is God. 
Number two, I love you because it is with you that these little people who are now a part of our lives, we've been blessed by God with them. We, we produce them and it's our responsibility to get them from here to heaven. And I thank her for that every time she tells me. I love you. You're second only to God. And we have done such a poor job as, as members of the body of Christ teaching about the incredible goodness. There's a fellow one time, uh, his first name was Butch, his last name fails me, said that, that he grew up hearing that, that sex was this awful, horrible, filthy thing and that we should save it for the person that we love most. <laughs> we've, done, we've done a really poor job in teaching who God is relative to human sexuality. Let's set these worldviews in contrast. And do this, by the way, of a man named Jeffrey Peterson wrote an article appearing in the Journal of Christian Studies, and this is what he wrote, and I quote, conventional elite wisdom, that's one worldview. Human wisdom, worldly wisdom that is a combination of romanticism, hedonism, and hyper-individualism. This conventional elite wisdom, the world is in love with celebrates rebellion against the created order. As a matter of fact, indeed, the idea, against the idea of a created order. Just the fact that that created order would exist, they rebelled against that. Now set that in contrast to a God that is good, to a God that has given us intimacy and wholeness and, and love and respect and support and encouragement from our spouse set those two things side by side and we understand this marriage is not a social construct it didn't come from the mind of human beings and therefore we may do with it whatever we want family and home was not a social construct sex is not a social construct the, the, one of the most common things that is said today is, well, since sex and gender and these things arise from, from humans getting together and, and coming up with what they wanted, then it can change. It can be different on Monday and different on Tuesday from Monday and different on Wednesday from Monday and Tuesday. It can be whatever you want, whatever you want. As a matter of fact, I think the, the current number, uh, 73 different genders. And, and it's being taught to children by way of our education system. And these little guys are four and five and six years old. They don't, they don't know. You ask them what they want to be. Well, I want to be a pirate. Oh, my granddaughter, still to this day, this, she's been on this for two years now. I want to be a ballerina. And bless her heart, she might be. But what's the likelihood of her maintaining that desire from four until she's 20. So, uh, how many of you loved your body when you were a teenager? Not many of us. Some, some did, but most don't. Look at ourselves in the mirror on the way to school. Man, my seventh grade, my seventh grade picture in, in, the, in the album that year, I would like to find every copy of the album that that was in and burn them. I don't know how it could have been so bad. And the person taking the photograph did not say to me. It's like, son, your hair is sticking straight out like this. And your glasses are sitting on your... I don't know how they got that crooked and stayed on. I don't know how I walked from one place to the other. What? I made it through that period. Sex, marriage, home, family, gender are not social constructs. They all are designed by God and arise from His nature. Therefore, I have no ability and I certainly don't have the authority to change them to fit whatever I want them to be. Desire. May I have desires and not sin? The answer is yes. May I have May one have inclinations and not sin? And the answer is yes. May one be tempted and not sin? And the answer is yes. 
I may have desired. I might desire, have the desire to go to, to Lake Charles to the casino every day of my life. And as long as I don't go, there's a difference. What I'm saying, there's a difference between attraction and action. And when I'm discussing these things with people, I need to keep that in mind. That one can be attracted. That one can have the desire and the inclination. One can be tempted. I heard a lady say this a long time ago when it stuck in my head. She said, she said, the birds can circle around your hair, but you don't let them oh, circle around your head. The birds can circle around your head, but you don't let them make a nest in your hair. So the desire, the inclination, the temptation, those aren't sinful. It's when I act on those things that it becomes something that's, that's different. All of these verses, and I would love to have the time to discuss them all, and we don't. Uh, there are people who have written books on, on same-sex attraction, same-sex marriage, on gender, on gender dysphoria, all of these. And there's more than one person that call these clobber verses. Now, they're not called clobber verses by folks in the religious world. They're called clobber verses by those with whom the discussions are being had who are part of the same-sex uh, attraction or same-sex marriages uh, or the uh, 2S LGBTQAI plus, those worlds, because these verses in their minds are used to beat them up. But if we're going to discuss these things from the only one who has the right and authority to set the standard, this is what God said. This is what God said. This is what God has done. And this is what we help people, the conclusion that we help them come to is with using these particular verses. I'm going to skip over Genesis 19, although I would love to spend a, an entire day on that. Genesis 1, 2, and 3, we've already talked about God's creative intent. Leviticus 18. 19 and 20. Uh, I do want to read in a moment. We'll wait. Leviticus 9, 18, 19, 20 uh, deals with the, the holiness of people, God's regulations for them. Uh, and in the context of that, sexual uh, intimacy is discussed. And with whom? Romans 1, 18 through 32. The, Gentiles, the Gentile world's alienation from God is evidenced in the sphere of human sexuality. And this is the reason why, as is true with all things that take us away from God, that are contrary to his will and opposition to him, starts with harm. And Paul makes, Paul, Paul presses that point in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, 18 through 32, that this begins in the heart, the movement away from, from God, and perverted man can't come, can't come, we're not going to elevate ourselves, we're not going to become more noble. We're not going to become more fair-minded. We're going to become more perverted. And this is a pretty hard-hitting section in this letter. He opens up with it. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. A list there of those who will not inherit the kingdom of, of heaven. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. Uh, those who are unrighteous uh, will not be in heaven either. So, five minutes to cover... Yeah, we'll do it. We got this. Genesis 1, 2, and 3, God's creative intent. God's creative works culminate in the creation of humankind. Male and female, made in the image of God and according to his likeness. They are given the divine charge to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Procreation, human mode of creation. We participate with God in that creative event. It's part of what makes humans correspond to the image of God. Humankind brought forth through the union, this one flesh arrangement of man and woman, is, and, and those who are entrusted with responsibility over the earth as God's representatives. Only when humankind arrived on the scene is the evaluation of the Creator's work upgraded from good to very good. Genesis chapter 1. Verse 31, God had done all of this creating. He then creates Adam, followed by Eve. And at the end of that process, he looks at them and he said, this is very good. In Genesis 2, the focus narrows to a relationship between the man and the woman. 
described as organic union in which they become one flesh. Genesis 2, verse 24. Interesting word, kinecto. It's a compound word. The Hebrew word for suitable. Eve was one who was fitting for Adam. He is a preposition meaning like or as. Kinecto is a noun meaning what is before or opposite to. So in some ways, if some we were looking at a chart with, with two big circles where those circles came together, Adam and Eve were alike in some ways. They were alike in the fact that they were both humans and they had the characteristics of being humanity. But then they were different from each other. One male, one female, by God's design and intention. Eve was like Adam, he, because she was human, but she was also different from him, Nego, because she was female. But the, the, the key to this entire discussion is that Eve was both suitable and a helper for her husband. When the two words are combined, they mean this, a helper as his corresponding opposite. Creation shows five contrasts. Heaven and earth, light and darkness, sun and moon, land and sea, male and female. And it's this, this difference, not sameness, that was God's mode of creation. What is man? Genesis tells us that a man is a human who can be united to a woman, his wife, with whom he can physically become one flesh. Genesis 2.24. A person with male anatomy is reflecting physically the fact that he has created a man, a male. A person with female anatomy reflects that she is a woman. Don't you think it's beyond, I don't even know the word. I wanted to say ridiculous, but I don't know that that's the right word. We're, we're a society and a culture of, of intelligent people, are we not? But you ask someone, just walk out on the street. I don't know, pick a town, it doesn't matter. Walk out on the street and ask them, what's a woman? And they're like, I don't know. No idea. They ask a, a, a woman who was a, nom a nominee for the U.S. Supreme Court, position on the court as a justice, highest court in the land, they ask her pointedly, what's a woman? She said, I don't know. Anatomy reflects that she's a woman. Maleness isn't only anatomy, but anatomy shows that there is maleness. Femaleness isn't only anatomy, but anatomy shows femaleness. Men and women are more than just anatomy, but they are not less. Our anatomy tells us what gender we are. Our bodies do not lie to us. This is written by Andrew Walker uh, in the book, God and the Transgender Debate. What does the Bible actually say about gender identity? When scripture talks about marriage, it says that sex difference, male, female, is an essential part of what marriage is. When you're having this discussion with people, ask them, what is, what is marriage? Where do you get that definition from? And what does the Bible have to say about what you just said? What is marriage? Where did the definition that you are operating by come from, and what has God said about this? Sex difference is woven into the fabric of Genesis 1 and 2. Woman is taken out of man. It says, woman, man, put them together. For this reason, man shall leave his father and mother, leave one home, father and mother, create a new home, husband and wife, explicitly male and female. And those two are able then to produce little human beings, and they produce those little human beings for the purpose of worshiping and honoring Yahweh Elohim. That's why they're created. That's why they're here. One flesh union of two sexually different people. Differences coming together in unity. This is a foundational principle from the nature of God himself. If you'll give me two more minutes. Amen. Leviticus Leviticus, imitating God's holiness. We're only going to be able to cover Genesis and Leviticus, but that's all right. It will do. The purpose of this book of Leviticus is purity. Imitating the holiness of God. As a matter of fact, 
the, the expression from Leviticus 19.2 is brought over in, into the New Testament by Peter, where Peter says, be you holy, be holy because I'm holy. Quoted that verse directly from Leviticus 19. So it's a book, a book to produce purity, holiness in God's people. They weren't, they were not to cross the boundaries established in Genesis. Israel was to be different from the other nations. Leviticus 18, these three verses. Moreover, you shall not lie carnally with your neighbor's wife to defile yourself with her. You shall not let any of your descendants pass through the fire to mole. Here's a question for us. Why did he follow the first one with the second? Well, it's my body. I'll do whatever I want to. Uh, sexual revolution of the 1960s. The expression was, well, sex is free. Love is free. Love is free. Love is not free. Love comes with a high cost. Agape love, unconditional love. When children are produced in those random encounters, guess what they did with them? They sacrificed them to Molech. They carried those infants to an idol out on the plain who had fire in his belly, and they put them on a tray, and the baby human being fell into the fire and was consumed by it. God said, that thought never even came into my mind. A God who knows everything. I never thought that. And these are my people. You shall not let any of your descendants pass through the fire to mold it, nor shall uh, you profane you profane the name of your God, I'm the Lord. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. So now we have three things in verses 20, 20 uh, through 23. Adultery. Sacrificing children to idols. And homosexuality. He says, don't lie. Men, don't lie with other men. It's an abomination. That's what God taught. Holy Spirit says it's an abomination to God. Nor shall you make with any animal, with any animal, to defile yourself with it. It's a perversion. The self-explanatory sins of Leviticus 18, 20 through 23 were designed to direct humans in a godly manner, to make them holy. The following destroyed that godliness. Adultery destroyed the stability of the home. That's what it does. Sacrificing children, pagan gods, destroyed the fruit of the couple. Bestiality polluted one made in the image of God with one that was not. Same-sex relationships are wrong because of the nature of the partner. Now, I need to say this really quickly. When we read Leviticus 18, 19, and 20, homosexuality isn't elevated above adultery or incest or bestiality. They're all on the same plane. They're all sins against God. It doesn't, it doesn't bring one out above the others. It says, don't do any of them. Be holy. The Hebrews did not have a word for homosexuality, so they would speak in terms or write in terms of heterosexuality. Consider these other wrong relationships. Adultery involves having sex with someone who belongs to another. Incest involves having sex with a relative. Bestiality involves having sex with an animal. One not made in God's image. Here's something for you. This is happening right now. It's not like, it's, it's not, people see an article like this and they say, well, it's not in Vider. We're okay. Not in Crystal Beach. Well, I'm telling you, coming soon to a city near you. Spain may legalize bestiality. They say, it's okay. It's okay for you to have sex with your donkey or goat or lamb or whatever it is. They passed a law, and on the heels of this law that says a boy can't do it before 12, but at 12, if he wants to be a girl, all right, we'll help him. As a matter of fact, we'll give him puberty blockers. We'll do sex reassignment surgery. We'll, we'll take off all of his stuff, and he never gets that back. On the heels of that, impressed with their victory, they decided, well, we'll just, we'll just pass a thing that says we can have sex with, with our sheep. Congratulations. I have a whole bunch of pictures at the end I would love to show you. If you want to see them, uh, my time is up. So if you would like to uh, afterward, what I will do, and I have a piece, I, I have a paper for you um, that 
two sides of this argument. And what you're going to hear a lot as you discuss this with people is they're going to say to you, those that are in this lifestyle, and understand, gender dysphoria is a real thing. It's a, there are people who are tormented. Uh, there are some who are not. There are some who are just outright evil, but not, not all of them. So there is a side that is affirming, and that tends to be people who are religious-minded, and they're looking for answers from God's Word, and then there are those who say, well, this is what God says. But the discussion with people is, what's going on right now is, well, that's, that's, that's what you're reading, but those words are mistranslated. I didn't make it to that, but it's in there. Those words are mistranslated. So for your personal study from 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, two words. Malakoi, Malakoi is the passive participant in a homosexual relationship. Arsenotokoi, Arsenotokai is the active participant. That second word is only used twice. It's used both times by Paul, once in 1 Corinthians 6, one in 1 Timothy 1. And it both times refers to homosexual activity. Men with men. Men burning in their lust for men. Adult men. And the, and the argument from Romans chapter 1 is, well, what's being condemned here isn't men with men. It isn't that. It's that men were taking advantage of, of children. That's what's condemned. That, no. Read the book. Anyway, my time is up. Thank you so very much for your kind attention and patience. I, I would love to have you know, another hour. <laughs> but I appreciate you so much for being.